Hey y'all, okay, we're gonna dive into chapter 11, which is pretty dense. So I do want you to like read the textbook, but I also want you to kind of focus on the stuff that I'm focusing on in the lecture, because it does go into a lot of detail in some places that we're just gonna um, skip a little bit. So things like what exactly um, the genes are in either side of an exertion sequence and a transpose and like, so just follow along with this lecture rather than getting too in depth in the textbook, okay? All right, let's go. Uh, here's the other half of the chapter summary and our overview. So uh, we've talked a lot about vertical transmission up until this point, and we're gonna start talking about horizontal transmission of DNA. So vertical gene transfer, this is when we have DNA being passed from one generation to another, either through uh, mitosis, where the cells are just dividing via asexual reproduction, or through meiosis where you have um, gametes from the mother and father combining to fertilizing uh, and becoming a new embryo zygote there okay so the genetic content of the progeny is very similar to those of the parents even in terms of meiosis you're still inheriting half of your dna from your mom and half from your dad now the contrast to this is horizontal or lateral gene transfer Okay, so where individuals in the same generation can swap DNA uh, through other mechanisms. So we're going to talk about the three main mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer in this chapter. Okay, so in the, the interesting thing about horizontal gene transfer, it can be a very slight amount of DNA or it can be a, quite a lot and it's not, it's very variable and it really depends on the particular uh, method of gene transfer transfer and the host and recipient cells. Then once the horizontally transferred DNA is, is either inserted into the genome or it's in a cell as a plasmid, then it can be transmitted vertically to the progeny of those cells. Okay. So we're going to talk a lot about donor cells. That's where the DNA is coming from. And then the recipient cells where the DNA is being inserted or acquired. So it's unidirectional. It doesn't have to be back and forth at all. It's uh, just a one-way transfer. And then um, so that donor could either be a cell, it could be a virus, uh, it can be a transposin that's within some sort of viral DNA. It could be free DNA that's just floating in the environment, although that's pretty rare. But some cells, some lines in particular strains of bacteria do just sort of acquire free floating DNA in case it might give them an advantage. And then as with any other um, type of DNA or sequence, uh, if something is disadvantageous to the cell, it's going to be at a selective disadvantage. If whatever it acquires is um, advantageous, uh, then it will be more likely to stick around and show up later in, in further generations. Okay. So if the recipient here, we've got our donor recipient, if it integrates the DNA into its genome, then it, the phenotypes encoded by the new DNA will be expressed, and then it could potentially transmit it to the progeny. So I mentioned plasmids, and plasmids are found in bacteria. A plasmid is basically a circular loop of DNA. Okay. Bacteria have their core chromosome, which is also circular, but then there's these little floating loops uh, within the cell that can get transmitted between bacteria and the same species or even different species. Okay. So this is plasmid, and there's a small P in front to indicate it's a plasmid, and then capital SB102. Okay. So the arrows are showing the direction of gene transcription. They could be going forward and backward, different uh, whether or not the coding gene is on the template strand or the coding strand. Okay. And then the um, little boxes that they're showing are just nucleic acid sequence repeats. And the, these plasmids can be huge, they can be tiny, they vary a lot um, in terms of their size and what genes are on them. In this case, in this plasmid, um, the yellow is, I believe, for self-replication and the red arrows there are for mercury resistance. And so this plasmid um, confers the ability to thrive in an um, environment heavily contaminated with mercury. Okay, so now that we've got a little terminology down, our first method of horizontal gene transfer as referred to is transformation. And this is when bacterial cells just take up DNA that's in the, in the environment. Okay, bacteria are particularly good at this. Um, Eukaryotic cells, not so much, okay, but uh, they could get it from a bacteria that has picked it up. Right? So our, we've got a free DNA here, and it is uh, one strand is generally taken up, replicated, and incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. 
So if that new DNA is going to be incorporated into the uh, bacterial chromosome of the recipient cell, then there's going to be these uh, two crossovers forming in between the host chromosome and the new DNA, in which a part of it is going to get um, inserted into the, the genome there. If the DNA is in plasmid form, it's going to exist separately from the bacterial chromosome and just have the little loops of DNA uh, in the cell. So it's not, plasmids are generally not integrating directly into the genome of the recipient, recipient cell. So here is E. coli that has had uh, a transformation occur. Okay. Uh, in this case, this is a plasmid was added to the E. coli, and the plasmid has both ampicillin resistance, so the bacteria here are only growing on this ampicillin-containing media because they have uh, the amp resistance gene. And then they have a green fluorescent protein, which lets us visualize the presence of the um, transformed gene that's also in that plasmid. Okay. Hopefully you guys have done this in either AP Bio or Gen Bio, the PGLO experiment. And there's some additional complications in there, which we'll talk about when we get to gene regulation in a couple chapters. Okay, so plasmids here, we can use them as a cloning vector. A cloning vector is basically a vehicle in order to move DNA around. So you take um, kind of a piece out and put the gene you want in, and then there's usually different ways of telling whether or not the gene has been um, uh, successfully transmitted into the bacteria. In this case, we're looking at a plasmid, okay? So we're gonna have our selectable marker for ampicillin so that we can put ampicillin in our media on the plates and any bacteria that's not transformed with this won't be able to survive. We have our origin of replication for replication and then we have this thing called a multiple cloning site, okay? Which is within a functional gene. It's within the LAC-Z gene. So basically what that's gonna do is give us a marker a place that if the LAC-Z gene is functional, then the gene wasn't inserted, okay? If we break the LAC-Z gene and it's not functional, then we know that we had a good insertion at this cloning site, okay? This cloning site has a lot of different spots for restriction enzymes to make cuts, okay? So we have a lot of different um, restriction enzymes we can use to uh, insert a gene. So this blue-white screening is the idea here, LAC-Z, will, um, if it is present, it will break down a dye that you add, this X-gal, okay? So if the, the DNA insertion goes well, it's gonna disrupt the LAC-Z gene and you're not gonna see um, the, any blue dye. So here we've got, if we've got a non-recombinant plasmid, the gene wasn't put in, they're gonna stay blue. But if we break LAC-Z and it no longer can um, make that dye, then we're going to have a white plasmid. So that's kind of the idea behind blue-white screening, whether or not you break this gene by inserting your new gene of interest. Okay. <clears throat> so that's transformation, which will probably come up again when we talk more about biotechnology. Uh, the next method of horizontal gene transfer is called conjugation. Okay. So conjugation is when we transfer DNA uh, between cells. Okay. They're literally directly contact. They form like a little tunnel. So think two spaceships and there's a little air tunnel where people are moving through. Um, and uh, the, the strip of DNA is gonna move through that little tunnel and into the recipient genome, okay? So there's these um, cells called F cells and that refers to a fertility factor that they're um, very, not all cells conjugate, some do it an awful lot. And those are what we call those fertility factor cells. So, um, they make this contact with a, a, a cell that doesn't have this form. And then as this plasmid is sort of replicated, it feeds one end through this channel and into the other cell. And then after that has completed, both cells have that F, um, F plasmid present in them. So here's the electron micrograph of cells and they're actually, you can see the channels that are forming and there's actually strands of DNA moving through those channels over time. Okay. So when it starts, uh, prior to the transfer, the plasma gets nicked, okay? And this strand here is going to move into the recipient cell while the intact strand that's not broken will just stay there and be replicated in the circle, the kind of the circle peeling off of the other circle like we saw before, okay? And so this nicked strand is sent over to the other cell while the intact strand stays in the donor cell and is replicated and to get your double-stranded plasma back. This nicked strand will eventually be reattached and replicated once it's in the recipient cell. Okay. So um, 
not all plasmids can do this. Uh, the ones that can are called self-transmissible or conjugative plasmids, and they need these four components to be able to move, okay? which we're not going to worry too much about, but there's basically some, 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 con some plasmids can move via conjugation and some can't because they're missing a um, part of this uh, thing. So don't, don't worry too much about this. Just know that they can or cannot move based on whether or not they have everything they need. So uh, what can also happen, so the plasmid can stay by itself here, it can just be a separate plasmid, or that plasmid can get integrated into the chromosome and it's always present there and it will be present in all the offspring of the cell and will get lost during binary fission. Okay? So we've got this HF, the F plus cell is this one that has the fertility factor and then if that fertility factor gets integrated into the chromosome we now have what's called a high frequency recombination cell. Okay? There's one particular site where it tends to go in but it can occur elsewhere. One thing about these various methods of horizontal gene transfer is they're not super specific. They're not going into like a certain place in the, in the genome every time, but uh, they have seen over time there's this one particular site that lends itself well to the um, uh, fertility factor getting basically cloned into. Okay, so here's sort of a close-up of the integration here. So we have homologous sequences that match pretty well in the F plasma in the chromosome. Um, between these two particular genes and then once they're integrated this uh, sequence is now part of the chromosome and now these genes are further apart so that's one of the ways they can tell whether or not this um, uh, gene or whether this is now a high frequency recombination uh, strain or not is by you doing um, like a PCR and looking for because um, you know the sequences over here and you know the sequences over here you can see whether or not your band size has increased whether or not the fertility factor has entered your strain. So these high frequency recombination cells now can transfer their entire chromosome during conjugation because they have integrated that fertility factor into their full bacterial chromosome. Okay? So same idea, it begins at the origin that fertility factor is the first thing to transfer in, but this time it's taking the whole loop of the chromosome with it. Okay? And so that's going to move in and become like the new bacterial chromosome in that new cell. But they do this a lot faster and a lot more frequently than just the regular fertility factor cells. So they're an interesting tool in um, genetic analysis. And how they actually do this, how they, um, they've built bacteria maps by looking at what genes were transferring on that full chromosome there. Over time, they would uh, almost watch this and cut it off after periods of, of minutes to find out what genes the new bacteria were lacking. Okay, so, um, so here at zero minutes is when the origin of replication came in, and then after eight minutes, if you cut this off um, after eight minutes, you would only have this one new gene. All right, but if you kept, let it longer, you could see what functions were getting lost. Uh, and then determine what genes were moving in at what time. So here's sort of from 0 to 72 minutes, the list of genes that they um, originally started moving. So here's like the galactose gene and the LAC-Z operon and everything uh, were in those original um, high frequency recombination cell lines. So here's the genetic map of E. coli, not based on sequence, uh, not based on markers or anything, but literally based on minutes, okay? How long that high frequency recombinant cell was sort of inserting its uh, new strand of DNA through the conjugation channel there. Um, so starting with the three named A being right near that center of origin, okay? So this is the time, this is minutes, the time needed to transfer the genes through conjugation is how we got actually our first maps, genetic maps of E. coli. So one interesting other species here is Agrobacterium. In the wild Agrobacterium, uh, both Tumefacians and Rhizogenes cause galls or diseases. They're a plant pest. Um, and so uh, this horizontal gene transfer is in this case actually going from a bacteria species into a eukaryote, a lot of different plant species. Right. And what we've done, scientists have, have, have learned, is so here's the normal process of agrobacterium infection is that agrobacterium has this uh, plasmid called the TI plasmid, or the trans uh, transformation plasmid. And it has a section of DNA in there called the tDNA. And that is uh, what the agrobacterium actually inserts into the chromosomal DNA of the plant cells. 
Okay, and the genes that are on the wild transfer DNA cause uh, cell proliferation, and they make this nice crown gall, which is a great little habitat for the agrobacterium to live in. So it's basically building its own home within the plant. Well, the plant doesn't particularly like that, it forms a gall, and uh, so you have a couple of plant diseases caused by that. What scientists realized is, hey, what if we chose our own DNA? What if we use the agrobacterium's insertion here, this plasmid it's got, but we take out the uh, disease-causing transfer DNA and we replace whatever it is that we want to DNA for a particular enzyme that we want to have in a plant and insert that gene into the plasmid okay, using restriction enzymes, DNA ligase. Uh, we're currently using like electroporation, so we zap the um, cells with electric current in order for DNA to slide into the uh, kind of cracks in the cell membrane. And once you have this agrobacterium line with this recombinant plasmid, with a whatever that gene is you want, then you let the agrobacterium do the infection for you. It will um, the T plasmid will behave as normal. You have the virulence genes, and then you will get that transfer DNA with that new gene that you've determined. It'll be inserted randomly somewhere into the plant's chromosomes, and then if you because plants are totipotent, you can grow. Uh, in most some plants that we've tried, you can take that one plant cell that you've transformed, say an embryo cell or a leaf mesoderm cell, and grow it back into a full plant via tissue culture or micropropagation, and now you have a plant that has a gene to produce that new enzyme, which will give you a new phenotypic trait. A lot of cases, this is something like insect or pest resistance in um, the American Chestnut Project. Uh, we gave it an enzyme in order to break down oxalic acid, which is the main weapon of the um, chestnut blight, but we'll get into that in a separate uh, chat at one point.